Hello. Uh, today we're going to talk about pay two. Uh, very exciting stuff. Uh, it might sound esoteric. Uh, it might sound like something that would be of interest to about seven people in a dungeon somewhere. Uh, but payments really matter to all of us, and pay two will matter more to us than uh, I think most of us understand. Uh, it is a new feature. Uh, we're going to go through what it can be used for, uh, roughly what the background to it is, but also understanding its links to open banking uh, and um, what and how we might think of the two of them together. So I'm Christian, uh, I'm the CEO of Maneuver. Maneuver is a North Sydney based uh, payments automation company and I'm very, very pleased to be talking to you about this that we are working on currently and are going live with uh, mid-2022. So um, let's think about what, uh, what Pay2 really is. So at its heart, it is a practical application of smart, real-time pull payments. That's what we're talking about today. Um, you will have heard uh, probably a few times about direct debits. Direct debits is the, um, the time when someone takes money out of your account. Ideally, you've authorized it in advance. Uh, it can be your utility provider. It can be um, some subscription service. It could be your, your gym, say, or Spotify or whatever it is that on a regular basis take money out of your account. Um, Pay2 is in its simplest interpretation, a very smart and real-time version of exactly that. And the reason we're talking about CDR, which we'll get to as well, the open banking, is because there seems to be um, a lot of overlap between the two concepts and the two ambitions. And so understanding how exactly they can or can't work together uh, and understanding what we should expect when is, uh, I would say, critical for, for businesses in Australia that are looking to really optimise how they manage their payment flows. All right, so um, let's get into the background. NPP, which is the new payments platform uh, and the, um, the provider of real-time uh, direct debits in the future, so Pay2, but also Oscar Payments, etc. at the moment, uh, was launched in February, we went live in February uh, 2018. The first transaction uh, was uh, done by the CEO of NPPA, Adrian Loveney, who made a donation to a, a charity. Um, there were very quickly uh, a number of different ways that you could interact and use the MPP services. Uh, often it was a matter of overlay, um, the, the initial conversations, and overlay servers uh, like OSCO, the one that probably most of us are familiar with, is a way of building on the, the, the existing infrastructure and providing value added services, but still sort of within the, the infrastructure itself. Uh, service number one was the sort of bog standard transaction, we call it the push transaction here on the slide. Um, by that, I mean, you can push $5, $50,000, whatever it may be, you can push money out of your bank account to someone else's bank account, and it happens in real time. The overlay component here is simply a matter of additional certification. There are additional SLAs that has to happen particularly quickly and, and so on. But there were other um, services, they were numbered, service one, two, and three, uh, that were very much discussed, particularly early on in MPP's life. Uh, service number two was a PDF attachment. So imagine that not, not only are you pushing money, but with your 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 five dollars, you're you're attaching a PDF that might be a description of what it is you're uh, you're paying for. It might be a receipt. It could be an invoice. Um, it could be I don't know a picture or something. As long as it's PDF attachment. And service number three, which is the reason I'm bringing it up here, was this request to pay. The initial concept was that there wouldn't be and would sort of never be a real time um, direct debit, if you want, uh, the, the ability for someone to take money from your account in, in real time. Instead, there was an idea of a request to pay where someone could send you, a consumer, a, a message straight into your banking app and saying, hi, uh, I am Optus, I want to take $5 out of your account, do you concede? Or it's, it's, it's your time to pay. And then you would, acting on that request to pay, push funds to, to the recipient, to Optus in this case. Um, there was then over time uh, an avalanche of interest into something that was more directly a pool payment, more directly a direct debit equivalent than this request to pay functionality. Um, and that is where mandated payment services come in, MPS. Uh, MPS has since earlier this calendar year, 30th of April 2021, changed name to Pay2, but it's exactly the same thing. The core idea here being that not only can you ask someone to pay, so the request to pay, but you can pull money from their account 
obviously subject to certain authorizations and consent mechanisms that we'll talk more about in a few moments. Um, so that's where that's how we end up with pay to um, and the, the, the topic of today is pay to and open banking and how they how they relate. CDR then, what's the background there and how does that relate to uh, anything I'm talking about now? Well, um, CDR is the the high level name for open banking and a number of other things. Um, we think of open banking mostly today when we talk about CDR because it's the first part of the CDR rollout. CDR being consumer data rights and it is a, a, a philosophically interesting um, policy uh, really pushed by ACCC. So MPP is primarily an RBA initiative, CDR is primarily an ACCC, so competition authority initiative, where the philosophy behind it is that the data about you that's sitting with a number of different service providers, primarily banks in the first instance, is your data. If you tell people where you live and what your age is and whatever else you have to tell, um, that information is yours to share with others. Now the banks in this case still retain certain value add rights if they do heaps of analysis on it or whatever it else may be, then that data is, is not necessarily part of the data you can share, but the, the basics are yours. And uh, the reason it's interesting from a competitor or a competition point of view is because um, you having to provide that same information a thousand times is a hurdle for, uh, for you to move to a different provider. If you know that you have to go through an arduous process of telling everyone who you are, again, you might decide not to, and that stifles competition. So open banking as far first part of CDR um, also has a, an evolution behind it, both in terms of its, uh, its current state and, and what it wants to achieve. Initially, and that's still where we are, CDR is focused on read access. What that means is you can read, you can share the information that you have with a third party. So uh, let's say I have my, I back CBA um, personally. So um, I can essentially instruct CBA to share my data with a third party provider because I'm interested in their services. Um, and it might be part of what they have on me that I want them to know. So for instance, uh, I might want to apply for, for a loan with someone else and that someone else uh, would greatly benefit from understanding my, my bank balance because they're going to lend me money. Um, and so there is a way here for that third party lender to read my bank balance. But to be clear, they are reading it only. They can't change it. I can't go through a third party app and change my my address or for that matter, my bank balance by making a transaction. This read access only uh, was launched about a year ago or a bit more, I guess, by now, 1st of July 2020. But the real holy cow here is to move to the right access component. Well, it's really doing the combination of the two. Right access means a third party can make changes to my data with, in this case, say, CBA. And the obvious but one obvious changes that you might want to make is changing that bank balance. And the way that you change a bank balance is to initiate a transaction. So we have here two very different ways of arriving at essentially the same point, which is how do we get a third party to move money from your bank account? Hence, the smart real-time pool transactions. To be very clear, pool transaction is different from push transaction in that a push transaction is one where you individually sit on, say, your banking portal, and at some point you press a, a pay button and in, introduce the, the payment details. So you want to send a particular BSPN account number or a PAID or similar, and again, you, you sort of press pay and it goes. So it's you pushing funds somewhere. A pool transaction is when a third party takes, pulls money from your account. The only way we do that currently, as I mentioned earlier, is through direct debits. And direct debits are, are not a very elegant way of solving the problem of pool payments. In fact, I would argue that it's sort of a last vestige of the Stone Age uh, that we still sort of take for granted and most of us are probably fully accepting of. We think it's perfectly fine uh, in many cases that it takes two, three days for a transaction to arrive where it's intended to be. But we are probably less and less likely to think that's okay. Uh, and there are more and more circumstances in which we think it really shouldn't take that long for my money to arrive where, uh, where it's intended because the money has already left my account. So where is it for two days? Where is it for three days? 
Um, and for the one who's receiving the funds to wait two days or three days just to find out that actually your money was never there in the first place and they'll have to do it again is a very, very poor experience and can also lead to a, a poor customer experience. We'll get back to that in a few minutes. But the reason this matters to me and my business is partially just a matter of expectations. Why ever should it take longer for money to move than for information to move? If we can move information uh, in real time and we um, really... Uh, a minimum of friction, then why is it so hard to move funds quickly? Particularly now that we know that through MPP, we can do it in real time in every other way. And it matters to merchants because a lot of merchants are not sitting on trillions of dollars in reserve. They actually need these funds to arrive quickly. And there's no point in uh, to them in waiting two, three days just to have to do it again. It's a, again, poor experience for them, often expensive experience for them, and a poor experience for the consumer. So it matters to all of us. And as we'll go through some of the use cases, I think it matters to probably more of us than we than we think. So um, let's talk about them more specifically then. And I'll get after this, I'll get into the use cases that I think are particularly of interest to um, Australian businesses and, and consumers in general. For businesses um, at the moment, a lot of us are uh, either, I guess, confined to and just resigned to waiting those two or three days before funds arrive. So if you are running a, um, I don't know, a club of some kind, a gym uh, with membership that you direct debit every every month or so, then you sort of just hoping, hoping, hoping that the money that you direct debit on the 27th is coming through on the 30th, hoping that people aren't dishonoring and, and all the rest of it. And then you have to chase it. It's an arduous process. And there are lots of good businesses out there that are offering sort of life cycle management of Direct debits. And the reason you need to have lifecycle management or direct debits is because there's so much to manage. Um, so making that streamlined, making it possible for you to direct debit someone and that very same second or within a few seconds at most, finding out, yes, money was there and money is now usable in my account right now, uh, it's going to make a big difference. And if it's not there, well, then you can take immediate action. There is another aspect of this as well, which of course e-commerce, and we'll get into that as well. At the moment, most businesses in an e-commerce setting are, um, are really limited to using credit cards, and there's a reason for that. For customers, there is also uh, an improved experience with, with pay to or real-time direct debits. First of all, um, cards can often be expensive, um, which is often how you do things uh, at the moment if you want to push funds, if you want to get money pulled from you in in, in, uh, in an e-commerce setting. Uh, you, often there is a merchant service fee that sometimes gets that get logged onto the, the customer. Um, but it's also that sense, and it's happened to me personally a few times, that in a direct debit setting, I might have given someone authority to take money out of my account, and I would just assume that's going to happen a certain day, and they just went gone on with my life. But in between the day when I thought it happened and the day where they actually do it, I have moved money out of that account, thinking that's already taken into to take into account in the balance that I have. Um, and then I'm called up a few days later saying, hi, Christian, we tried to direct debit your account and uh, the money just wasn't there. Bad experience. And you know, I think a lot of us would really, really want to be told, um, maybe by a bank even, that uh, you have a few direct debits coming up. And maybe you want to top up your account just to avoid the sort of sometimes embarrassing and in every, kind, every case inconvenient situation. So there's a real direct um, customer or consumer uh, benefit that you can that you can uh, leg onto your, your customers by having a better way of doing direct debits. So let's talk about specific use cases. And I think this gets getting more and more um, getting more specific is is also getting more interesting for a lot of us. So the first setting is one that I've now flagged a few times, which is essentially every time you see a direct debit working today, imagine that being real time. Imagine there being zero dishonest because every time, well, zero dishonest that you're unaware of, because every time you try to direct debit someone's account, you get an immediate confirmation in the form of money in your account that money was indeed there. And if it's not there, then you can act on it immediately, not two, three days later. So anytime you see direct debits, imagine if you could do that real time. Um, also imagine if you, as a customer, and this is coming back to the customer component, had more control. I think it might have happened to most of us that a utility provider or a service provider that maybe we've been loyal to for for uh, for too long sometimes, and then cancel and move somewhere else for for whatever reason. It can be a gas provider, it can be, as I said, maybe a mobile phone provider. Still, by probably no malintent, happened to direct debit us still the month after we terminated our contract, and we have to chase the eighty dollars that were not meant to go to them. With the way that Pay2 is going to be set up, not only will it happen much faster, it happen much smarter. 
the kinds of consent and authorization that I as a consumer can give to make very, very specific when, how and how much someone can debit my account will give me way more control over those transactions when they're taken out of my account. I can, for instance, the utility provider say you and only you can ever can take I don't know, $200 from my account on these dates in a month. And that's it. Uh, you know, you can't take $201 uh, and you can't move away from those particular days. Other consents that I might be able to give are uh, maybe there's someone I, I deeply have a you know, strong trust for and realize that actually it's in the nature of what I need to pay for. Actually, maybe that is a better example for the utility um, is that it will vary. Some months I'll use more electricity than other months. Um, and so the fact that sometimes it is 210 rather than 200 rather than 190 is, is perfectly fine. Um, so you can think of the different use cases, but the fact is I can control it very, very with, with great precision and that I can cancel it. On, you know, on my own in my own banking app will be very helpful. So I think direct debits, think very fast direct debits and think very clever and sort of uh, precise direct debits. Um, a second use case here is real-time funding of large volume disbursements. There are two obvious examples, but I'm sure we can think of any, even more of them. Um, payroll and dividend payments. But again, we can think of any situation where some entity has to make probably lump but lumpy but very large uh, payouts to beneficiaries. So again, using the payroll example, a company is paying all their employees on the 15th of the month. At the moment, if you're outsourcing that to a payroll company, you need to make sure that they have the funds in whatever account that they control in time for those large volume disbursement for salaries to be paid out. And you can do that in a fully automated way by giving them direct debit authority on your account. But that means they have to take money three days ahead of the actual disbursement. Otherwise, the money possibly will not be there on time, uh, which may means people don't get their salaries on time and uh, you know, bad experience for everyone involved. But three days when talking about large volume disbursements are probably quite expensive from a treasury point of view. You, you're sort of not sitting on money that could earn you income uh, or an interest for, for a few days. Or you can make it slightly less automatic. This is another um, option that's available already, which is you, of course, push payments to your payroll provider. You, you make a, um, a direct credit or an OTGS transaction to them that they then um, sort of funds the account and from there on they, they do large disbursements. What we can do with Pay2, with a clever and, and, and uh, fast direct debit equivalent, is that you can have that funding mechanism not only automated, like with the direct debit, but extremely fast. You can have it just a few minutes or seconds even before the dismissing goes ahead. So there's no treasury impact and there is no manual processing that you need to worry about, funds going the wrong way or not happening on time or whatever it may be. Same thing with dividends. You you fund the, the the disbursement account just a few moments before you do the full disbursement, and you can do it fully automatically in a very controlled environment. Um, the third one is something that I think is really exciting. Um, it's slightly less obvious to us as consumers, but some of us, probably most of us, have some engagement with custodial and uh, trust accounting setting. That could be our superannuation. It can be I don't know if we have investment accounts, um, sometimes has to do with real estate. Maybe the bonds are sitting in an environment which is sort of has custodial services uh, regulation on top of it. At the moment, if you are a custodial service provider, if you are a uh, wealth management provider and you need to rely on things being um, in a trust or trustee setting, then it is often very hard to allow a third party, like a payments automation business, such as, for instance, Maneuver, to to touch funds at any point because the, the funds must not move between a trustor's account and trustee's account sort of via someone else. And that is exactly as it should be. There are good reasons for this regulation, but it does make it very hard to automate payments because um, uh, payments services provider generally has to sort of, even if it's only for a few seconds, many has to pass through them to get to where the beneficiary actually is. The, uh, the great thing with Pay2 is that it makes it possible to separate the instructor or the initiator of the transaction from the beneficiary or the, the, the destination of the transaction. So a large wealth management company could instruct Maneuver to take money out of, uh, I don't know, Jane's personal account and then send straight to the wealth management's trustee account to be invested in a share portfolio or, or whatever it may be. And Maneuver, that instance, has not touched funds even for three milliseconds 
we have initiated, we have automated, we have reconciled, we're sitting on all the information that's required to give both parties a very good experience, but we have not once, not for even half a second, sat on any funds. Um, and that makes it possible for the first time ever to automate um, payment flows properly and without really limitations in this custodial and trust accounting setup. Um, and finally, is repeat use of e-commerce. This is one of the, the use cases that probably will be less strong in the beginning as we start to roll out pay, uh, pay to in the next um, in the next year, uh, but that will come in future iterations, which is um, a very exciting thing. At the moment, you're essentially, um, you, you have to use credit cards because generally that's the only way of keeping your customers, if you're an e-commerce provider, keeping your customers inside your own environment without asking them, therefore, to go to their banking portal, push money to you, and then come back to you. The risk is, of course, they leave, they get distracted. Um, you're intended to buy those shoes, but your cat shows up in your room and you forget to buy the shoes and, uh, and all of a sudden the e-commerce provider has only half the transaction. Uh, you want to have at least one full transaction and, and pay two will make it possible to compete properly with cards in a way that is a better experience in, in many ways. You can um, have a, uh, a really controlled, again, environment in which you know how much you can spend on certain things uh, and in certain environments, I should say. Uh, you can have a very fast money movement for the merchant, which is critical at the moment with a credit card. You get a guarantee of funds, but you don't actually get funds immediately. This will change with pay too. And you can keep them and critically inside your own environment. So lots of benefits there. And I think there'll probably be a cost benefit as well. It's not a percentage of value, it's a fixed fee type uh, transaction. So all four of them, very interesting. Now, to touch on, on the, the point I uh, was making earlier that we have two very different um, genesis and ending up in a very similar um, um, sort of value proposition. So, you know, Pay to or open banking, so CDR payments. Um, what is it that we, what should we think about this? Well, at the first level, I think for most of us, it probably doesn't really matter. Uh, there are, as we said, very distinct differences in how they arrive at it, but they're trying to achieve very, very similar things. Smart, consent-driven full payments. Um, you know, whoever does it first, um, I think is, is going to deliver a great service to, to Australian consumers and Australian businesses. And that is maybe the main point at this, at this point. It is the fact that, uh, Pay2 is happening in mid-2022, and open banking uh, payments are not. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that there aren't things that we can... Uh, so, so my point stands here, it's just that we don't have to wait for right access open banking to make these kinds of transactions happening. We can do it already mid-next year. Companies like Maneuver will be there to facilitate those transactions for a large number of merchants who, who will be better off because of it. But there are, of course, clever ways, and this is very much being thought of at the moment by... Um, both strands of, of um, organizations, both on the MPPA side and on the CDR side, um, is that we can combine the two of them by playing to their respective strengths. CDR consent structures, which are going to be very, very strong, they're already very strong in the, the read access uh, environment that we or that's already live, can work together, hopefully, with pay to payment infrastructure so that you're using MPP rails to move things very fast in a trusted way that's happened since 2018. And we don't have to wait for years for this to sort of be uh, reinvented. Um, but we're getting the consent mechanisms to do so in a way that's compatible with CDR. So we're not dealing with two systems that don't speak to each other. So um, lots of things happening in a very short period of time here. CDR MPP in itself is not that old and now pay to coming. Um, so the question, of course, is, well, what's next? Um, I mean, at, we will keep hosting uh, these sort of information sessions. This is the first one. There'll be more, and particularly as we get close to the live date, mid-2022, uh, we'll, we'll uh, have more and more sessions available to our both existing clients and prospective clients. Um, we will make sure that there's a sandbox, um, a testing sandbox live, so consequence-free environment for, for us and, and our partners to move um, pretend money around to understand exactly how it works. And there'll be plenty of things happening at an industry level. We should expect there to be lots of educational sessions. We should expect there to be lots of consultation with people in the payments industry around what use cases are and aren't useful. And as we progress beyond live date in mid-2022, we should expect there to be further iterations on pay two. And as right access gets closer on CDR, we should also expect that conversation to really gather pace. Um, for now, Thank you very much for uh, for listening to me today. If you're interested in finding out more, here are some details. Uh, me and the team at Maneuver would love to hear from you. Thank you very much.